Hallelujah.
was once like a bird in prison I dwell no freedom from my sorrow I fell but Jesus came listen to me well glory to crescendo in this house and let Cincinnati know that we know Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Praise God. Praise God. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm so glad you're beside me. Turn to the person on the other side of you and say, I guess I'll put up with you too. <laughs> I'm only teasing. Do you love Jesus? I said, do you love Jesus? I believe that. Give him another great shout of praise before you sit down. Amen. And while you're at it, welcome our online congregation. And thank God for them. Amen. You may be seated. We want to welcome you to Life Change Church, where Jesus is glorified, Lord, and King of all things. The Holy Ghost reigns in our heart, and God gets the praise. Amen. Amen. Ushers, I want you to quickly get in place, and we're going to receive the morning tithe and offering. And I know that you're, you're excited about giving those online. We're, we, we encourage you to worship God in your giving today. And right there on your screen, you, you can probably navigate and see just how easy it is to be able to bless what God is doing here at Life Change Church. Exciting things are happening. And I believe it's going to get better and better and better if we'll press into him and listen to what the Lord has to say and obey his voice. Can you say amen? amen. 
Father, I pray that you'll bless this offering, multiply it, and use it to establish your covenant on this earth for the preaching and propagation of the gospel, for the saving of souls, that your name would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.
Praise God. Amen. Well, you remember the day, the day the Lord saved you. I think you're happy about it. Praise God. I'm glad he ever saw fit to reach down and save an old wretch like me. I want you to turn with me in your Bible to 2 Kings chapter 6. And I want to announce that um, I have some newfound friends that are visiting today from way up north. And uh, they informed me last evening that they're used to short sermons. <laughs> I said, you're a little further south now. <laughs> so uh, just for their benefit, I'm cutting this back to an hour and a half today. <laughs> Second Kings chapter 6 I want, to, I want you to stand please And let us reverence the word of God Second Kings chapter 6 And verse 1 And the sons of the prophets Said unto Elisha Behold now the place where we dwell Is too small for us Let us go we pray Unto Jordan and take every man a beam And let us make us a place there Where we may dwell And he answered go and one said, Be content, I pray, and go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them. When they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried and said, At last, Master, for it was borrowed. The man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick and cast it in. And the iron did swim. Therefore said he, take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and took it. Now I want you to bold in your mind, italicize it, underscore it, whatever it takes to draw attention to it. The last part of verse 6. <clears throat> where it says, and the iron did swim. And the iron did swim. What we need today is the supernatural Provision of God. What we need is the supernatural provision of God. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you and praise you for every person that's here. And whether we know it or not, all of us have something laying at the bottom of our, of our heart. All of us are facing things in life that we don't have the answer to. But God, I know that you do have the answer. And I pray that each and every one of us today will put faith in you and receive what we need this day. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The sons of the prophet here in the Old Testament realized they had a problem because the school that they had, the school of ministry, was growing. And they were out of room. So they go to Elisha and say, listen, can we go and build a bigger place. That's a good problem to have. And he gave them the permission. They wanted him to come along, and he said, I'll go with you. Now, I want to ask you to do something, Gabe. Just turn this down just a little bit for now. So they went, they went with him, and uh, he went with them, rather. And there was one man who obviously was struggling financially in life. He borrowed an ax so that he could help. Now, I appreciate his initiative. I appreciate the fact that he wanted to do something. Here he is, uh, even borrowing an ax so that he could be part of the work of God. Now, there's a lot that I could say there, but I'm just going to go on. I will say this. Isn't it interesting how it always seems to happen this way? When you borrow something. I don't care. It seems like every time I borrow something, I either lose it or it breaks. And this man borrows the axe and he's swinging away at the base of a tree. And as he's swinging, the axe head flew off the handle and into the water. And as you would know, it, it sinks to the bottom of this lake. He turns to Elisha and says, I don't know what I'm going to do. It was borrowed. Obviously, he didn't have the money to buy an axe to begin with, and he borrowed this one. Now this one's broke, so he couldn't go and replace it. 
Now, I want to say at the offset of this, I have preached this story, I suppose, the last 27 years, and especially when I traveled extensively, I've preached this story at least 250 times. I've got an incredible outline that I could give you right now that I know you would be wowed by. And some of you could probably go ahead and write it down for me because you've heard me preach this a couple times through the years. But I'm not going to preach it exactly like I've always preached it. As I sat back here, the Lord gave me something specifically for this service. And I want you to listen to me. We live in a day in the church. And I don't say this as a slight. I don't say this to attack. I say this because it's true. I even think it's good, but we live in a day where the church has become very spectacular. Let me say that again. We have better than we've ever had before. Better buildings, better lighting, more educated preachers, incredible programs. We've got the cameras, we've got the lights, we've got the screens, we've got the new cool dress. We've got it all. You know, I, I was here a couple of weeks, three or four weeks ago, had a suit on. I looked out. I was the only person in the building in a suit. And I'm like, why do I have this monkey suit on when nobody else? <laughs> you know what I mean? What am I doing here? So I decided to put my boots on. I traded in my suit for boots. Thank you, brother. Don Crook said I look good. Of course, you know, he's blind in one eye and can't see out of the other. But that just happened. <laughs> But we have become very spectacular in the church. We can put great production in on. And don't misunderstand me. I think what we do ought to be done with excellence. And I think we ought to have the best. Amen. 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 I'm not against any of that. I want all of it. I love every bit of it. I think we ought to have the best and be up to date. Contemporary with the times. Absolutely. And we ought to be that in the church. Listen to me. We ought to be that in the church. We're that everywhere else. Very few of you pulled in in a 1955 DeSoto this morning. You are up to date. You go clothing shopping, you get up to date. I see a few of the older people that's still wearing something. They figure it's going to come back in style one of these days. I don't know. But we are up. I think we ought to have all of it. Don't misunderstand me. But in our efforts today to be spectacular, there's something conspicuous because of its absence. And that's the supernatural. Listen to me. This book right here that I hold in my hand, that black back book that sits on your nightstand, from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation, it is full of the supernatural. I want to tell you this morning, the God that we serve is a God of the supernatural. He's a God of might and he is a God of power. He's the God that can step out on nothing and speak the world into existence, fling worlds off the tips of his fingers, fling stars against the black velvet of the night until you're a while with the galaxies and the constellations. I want to tell you the God that we serve can open blinded eyes and unstop deaf ears and cause lame legs to leap for joy. He can stand on the outside of a tomb and call Lazarus out of the grave and that dead man come wiggling out of that grave. God is a God of the supernatural. I'm about ready to preach in just a minute. I can't help it. I get a little stirred up sometimes. From cover to cover, God is a God of the supernatural. Jesus walked the sandy shores of Galilee. He did the supernatural. You leaf your way through the pages of the book of Acts, and it wasn't dead, dry religion, cold, liturgical, nothing. No, those boys in the book of Acts, they were housed and filled with the power and presence of the Holy Ghost, and everywhere they went, there was a riot or a revival. God did something big everywhere they went. It's in your Bible. Try reading it. It's a great book. You'll love it. New York Times bestseller. Unreal for a lot of years now. God is supernatural. We've become very spectacular and very well fixed. 
And I want you to listen to me. For every person in Claremont County, in Cincinnati, Hamilton County, Brown County, and anywhere else you can go, what every person in Batavia, in Milford, wherever the Lord plants us, listen to me, what every person needs is what this man needed. That man had a problem that he could not fix, and I want you to listen to me. Whether you realize it or not, all of us have a problem we can't fix, but the truth is we live in a day where people think that they don't need help. But I can guarantee you I can promise you, if you don't have a problem right now, there's going to come a time in your life where you're going to face something that you have no power at all to fix it. I can promise you, you're going to come across something. Something's going to happen in your life. Something's going to happen to you physically. Something's going to happen in your home. Something will happen in your finances. Something's already happened to us called sin, and none of us can fix that. The truth is that we're all going to face something at some point where we have absolutely no power. All of our ingenuity, all of our planning, all of our talking, all of our writing on the piece of paper, the all of the carrying it out, it does not matter. Every effort we put in it, that man could have tried to fix that problem and drown doing it. And humanity right now is drowning, jumping in the pond, looking for a piece of iron that they'll never find. Come on. At the bottom of your heart, just like at the bottom of that lake, something resting there that medical science and psychology hmm. listen doctors can cut and they can prescribe but they can't heal Amen. I just said something yes. always remember they're called it's called a practice for a reason Doctors are practicing on you. I don't care how many times they've done it. They're still learning every time they cut you open. They're practicing. Now, if they're going to do it, I'd just soon have a guy that's done it a lot. I wouldn't want this the first time he's had a scalpel in his hand. And I'm not against doctors, even though I'm not big on... I don't even have a doctor because I am a specimen of health. I mean, look at me. I'm that's a joke. <laughs> what, Katie? Really? You want to be grounded again? <laughs> Years ago, I went to a doctor, and they were giving me a, a complete physical. And it happened to be a female doctor. And I, we got to a certain part of that exam. <laughs> and I was unnerved, to say the least. And she said, Sir, just relax. I do this every day. I said, not to me, you don't. <laughs> she kind of laughed. She said, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Medical science can cut and they can prescribe. But they cannot heal. And I'll tell you something that a doctor can never do. They can never walk into that terminal patient and look at them and give them hope. All they can do is say, we've done all that we can do. Now, they can never look at that person on their deathbed and say the words they need to hear. And that is, I am the resurrection and the life. But Jesus Christ can look at the man and say, he who believes in me will never die. Oh, I'm sorry, my Michigan friend, but it might be a long one after all. Hmm? They can cut, they can prescribe. But Jesus Christ can walk in that room and I want to tell you something right now. They can say you've got six months or a year. And they can say there's no solution. There, you're always going to have this, that, or the other. But Jesus Christ, the great physician, will decide what help you have and what help you don't have. And he'll decide when you live. And he'll decide when you die. 
not medical science. Psychologists probe into the inner world of a man's mind, try to unravel the conflicts of his emotional state, and the more they probe, seemingly the worse off they get. We have the ability to probe the far recesses of outer space. And somehow fling a piece of metal close enough to the moon to where the gravity of the moon pulls it in and they jump off and take a stroll. But come back and can't even conquer his own habits. Do you hear what I'm saying? Man can walk on the moon, but he can't stop lying. Just ask the politicians. <laughs> Someone said, how can you tell when they're lying, when they're talking? <laughs> I'm only teasing. If you're a politician, I mean everyone but you. I was teasing there last winter. I went down. They said, I said, boy, you can tell it was cold today. I said, why? I said, well, I drove down by the courthouse and the politicians had their hands in their own pockets. <laughs> I'm in a great mood today, you know? <laughs> oh, I just offended every pop. Honey, I'm, I'm, I don't mean you, Bob. You're the only honest one. You don't take anything from me. At least, you, at least I don't know how much you are taking, really. <laughs> Vote for Barb. I trust her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, we find ourselves at some point in life up against something that we don't have the answer. We don't have the solution. And every man, every woman is plagued with a problem that they cannot solve. Condemnation of our own heart. The darkness of sin that we're all born into and we all do. We've all sinned. And we don't have the answer for that. Absolutely not. Now, I'd venture to say most every one of us in here, like that man. We're going along in life and everything's okay. And then something breaks. Swing along just fine. Now what am I going to do? Where do I turn? Who do I talk to? Who can help me? I've gone here, I've gone there, I've talked to him, I've talked to her. What do I do? I've tried everything. And it's just broke. This man. to Elisha. He went to the right place. The Old Testament prophet is God's representative in the world. Had no Bibles, no churches. They would hear from God and speak and act. And their actions and their words, their life sometimes would speak what God was saying and bring resolve to solutions in society or whatever it may be. Or even help in an individual's life. So when he turned to Elisha, he was in essence turning to God. Right. Yeah. Right. Elisha, what am I going to do? It was borrowed. I have no money. I can't buy. I'm up against something that I don't have the answer for. And Elisha did something very interesting. This morning before the service, I had some fellas go out there in the yard and help me. I'm going to bring these up here.
Elisha did something very interesting. It's in your Bible. I read it to you. He went over and he cut a stick. The Bible says he cast it in the water. He threw it in the water. I want you to listen to this. And the iron swam. Maybe that don't do anything for you, but brother, that's putting something all over me right now. The iron swam. What's it take to make a piece of iron? I tell you what, let's just see how good you are. When you go home this afternoon, if you have an ax, if you don't have one, stop and buy one. And you get home, you find you a pond or a pool somewhere, and you, you wiggle that head off of that thing and throw that piece of iron in the pond or pool and then just stand there and say, all right, come on, now swim. Let's see you do that. Hmm? Paul tells me he can't even float, let alone tell a piece of iron to float. He told me the other day, he said, I can't. He said, I, people lay on the water and float. He said, every time I lay, I sink to the bottom. I said, well, it's because your big head drags you down. <laughs> I didn't say that, did I? But I did now. <laughs> I love you, buddy. I hope you still love me. And his wife said, hey, man. We can't. That is something we can't fix. We can't do. Just like the problem in your life right now. Just like the issue in your heart. Just like the problem in your mind, emotion, body, whatever it may be. It is a piece of iron at the bottom of the pool that you can't make it swim. But Elisha, oh, I feel this. Cut a stick and he threw it in the water. And the Bible says, and the iron did swim. Listen to me, church. That fellow that lost the axe head, a good sermon wasn't going to help him. All the screens and lights and cool outfits and coffee mugs and pretty words would not help that man. We could have sung for 15 hours straight and sung it over and over and over and over and over, and that will not help him. We might make him feel a little bit better. I tell you what, brother, I know you're really going through it. Let's go, let's go listen to some good comedy and make you laugh. And after he was done laughing, that piece of iron still at the bottom of the... I tell you what, brother, how about we just go get drunk? And people try to drink their problems away, and that, 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 that we'll just get drunk. And so they, they go get drunk, and, and, and maybe they feel better for a little while, but the reality is when they wake up the next morning, that piece of iron still laying at the bottom of that pond. You can go to church till you're blue in the face until you know everything that's religious about that church and know the pastor's middle name and know how to write him a check. I just wanted to make sure that you were still here. I mean, you can do it all. And the bottom line is go to church, kiss rings, bow before statues, hear sermons, do Hail Marys, and, and come on, come on. Come and sing and raise your hands and shout. All of that will not cause that piece of iron to swim. And I'm not against any of it. Don't misunderstand me. I'm just saying. I'm preaching something this morning. I just wish. He cut a stick. You know what that stick represents? Come on, you don't have to be a Bible scholar to figure this one out. Give me the key of B flat. On a hill far away. Stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest stand best for a world of lost sinners. 
So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown There's one power. There's one power, one event stands at the center of all the ages. Yeah. The Son of God hung between two worlds and two thieves and shed his blood. Yeah. It is the cross that brings the supernatural. Yeah. Singing, shouting, clapping, Laughing, I want to do it all. I want to enjoy life to the fullest. Well, I love to get out and ride my bike for about two hours, and I feel good when I do it, but the, problem, the reality is I can ride my bike and that iron's still laying there. Right, right, right. You hear me? I'm preaching so good right now, I can't hardly stand up myself. That's the cross. It's the cross. If we want God on the scene, if we want the Holy Spirit to move, we need to lift up the cross. Amen. We have one thing to preach, and that is Christ and Him crucified. Amen. It is Christ that is the answer. He doesn't have the answer. He is the answer. When the prophet cut that stick, he was saying, there's one thing that can reach all the way down. And touch the deepest, darkest crevice of your heart and soul. And cause iron to swim in your life. The cross. Years ago, before I was pastoring here, pastoring another church, a young lady come, her husband, They came to faith in Christ, came forward, accepted Jesus Christ. And not long after, she kept pestering her stepdad and her mother to come to church. And finally, you know, he, he didn't have nothing to do with church, and they, she wasn't raised in church. He went when he was a little boy, I think, to a Lutheran church, and uh, I love the Lutherans. He, he, he really had nothing to do with it whatsoever. Finally, he came. Ed and Carol, they, all, they sat right in the front row. I'll never forget this as long as I live. He sat right, right, right there. If we were in this building, he would have sat right there. Carol and then his, his stepdaughter and her husband and the rest of the family, they sat right in the front row. And I thought to myself of all the places for him, for her to march him to, the front row, because this man was one of the angriest person I ever seen. He sat there. He's just an old hillbilly. I mean, an old hill jack that lived in the city of Columbus, and he, he was just an old redneck, and he came in church that morning with bib overhauls on and sat right there on the front row. And the whole time I preached, Ed folded his arms and had a look on his face and darts coming out of his eyes. I, I truly felt like he wanted to get up and tear me apart. He, he looked like he absolutely hated me. Kind, kind of like you, love that. He wanted to strangle me, is what I felt. And I got a little unnerved. You know, I, I move around when I preach, and I got to be honest, I've stayed away from that side of the church quite a bit. That <laughs> to my surprise, the next Sunday, he came back, and we had Sunday night service. He came back Sunday night. The week after that, he came back, and was there Sunday night, and, and Sunday morning, Sunday night, and we had Wednesday night service, and he came that Wednesday night when he walked in, and I thought, well, my goodness. For someone that hates us so much, he's coming. And that night, he walked up to me. And I had no idea really who he was, other than I figured it was her daddy. He came up to me, and he grunted at me through his teeth. He said, I, I want to talk to you. That's exactly how he said, I want to talk to you. And I said, well, well, he said, not now. He said, after church, we'll talk after church. I said, okay. That's fine. 
What are you talking about? <laughs> well, meanwhile, one of my elders who knew him, grew up around there, came to me. He said, do you know who that is? I said, well, that's Kelly's dad. He said, well, that's Kelly's dad. He said, that is Mad Dog. <laughs> that's what his nickname was. Mad. Have you ever seen a mad dog? You grew up in the hills, you've seen mad dogs. You used to have dog fights over, well, that's against the law, but we used to have dog fights over where I come from. Mad dog, they call him. And uh, they said, Randy was like, he's like, listen, Troy, he said, he's dangerous. Everyone around here is scared to death of him. He said, for no reason, you can be sitting at a stoplight, and if you just, if someone just looks over at him and he don't like the look that they have on their face, he has been known been put in jail for literally just getting out of his car, walking over and ripping out of the car and giving him a thrashing right there on the street. And I thought to myself, and this man wants to talk to me. <laughs> this is not good. So after church, I hastily ran up to him among a crowd and said, all right, uh, Ed, Ed, what... Let's talk. We can sit right here on the front pew. And he said, I'm not talking here. I, I, I want to go over to the office. Now, our office was in a house across the street in a separate place away from everybody. And I said, oh, we don't need to go over there and unlock that. We can just talk right here. He said, no, I'm not talking here. I want to go over there. And I thought, well, dear God, here we go. I've got to go over to the office. <laughs> And so I'm on my way over, and I'm looking, going out of the building. I'm looking at every usher. that I mean, I got wonderful ushers. Not a one I'm looking at me. I couldn't get no one's attention to go with me. And I thought, I'm going to fire every one of these clowns. I can't believe this. I mean, nobody even looked at me. And here I am walking across the street with Mad Dog and his wife. And I mean, I am truly a little bit nervous. And I'm praying, God, you're going to have to help me. If I've ever needed you, I need you now. Will you help me? I was, I was doing, I was Catholic. I was everything. I was trying it all. Whatever I need, God, please be here. With, just take care of me. Watch over me. Or this could be my night. I'm coming home. Open up the gate. Heaven is real tonight. I'm come, I mean, I wasn't sure. I'm being honest. I was a little bit nervous going over there. We get in my office. I pull the chair around. It's just a small office. I pull my chair down. And there was just dead silence. What well, felt like was eternity. And the head moved his printed teeth. His face contorted and his eyes so piercingly angry. He said, I'm mad at God! I'm mad at God! And before I realized it, I'm sure prompted by the Holy Spirit with his thumb in my back I jumped out of my chair and went over, and they don't teach this in Counseling 101, but I went over and I poked him in the chest, and I said, Ed, you have no right to be mad at God, before I realized I'd been there. <laughs> and then I realized I'm poking mad dog. <laughs> Sir. <laughs> and I sat back down. But listen to me. About that moment, his bottom lip began to quiver. And the tears pushed out the corner of his eyes and traced down his cheek. He said, you're right. I don't have a right to be mad at God. I said, Ed, what are you so mad about? He said, over 20 years ago, the pride of my life, I had the most beautiful little boy. I love my son. He went everywhere with me. He brought such smiles to my face and joy to my heart, unlike anything I'd ever experienced in this life. But he said, in a tragic accident, in an instant, instant his life was taken. And I bore my little dead son up, carrying myself to 
to the funeral home. And then I picked up his little casket myself. Wouldn't let no one else be a pallbearer. I picked that boy up. It was hard, but I picked it up and I carried that casket to the grave. And I shoveled the first shovel of dirt on that thing. And I said, if there is a God, I don't want it to do with me. Why would he do this to me? He said, if there's anybody happy, I hate them. I hate them. If any daddy's got a son or any son's got a daddy, I hate them. I hate them. And I hate life. And I'll exist and I'll get by and I'll drink and I'll fight and I'll carouse and I'll do whatever I want to do. But I'm just going to do whatever I can do to survive until I get out of this whole world. I hate it. He said, I hate it. But he said, I'm so tired of hating. But I can't fix this. And then he said, don't be surprised if I don't come to church this next Sunday and come up at that order you got there and pray and ask God to come in my life. I said, Ed, we don't have to wait till Sunday. We can cut sticks and see supernatural things happen on Wednesday. He said, you mean we don't have to wait till Sunday? I could ask God to help me now, come into my life? I said, absolutely. Let me cut a stick. <laughs> Listen to me, church. Our only business is to cut sticks. Amen. Yeah, that's good. Take people to the cross. Yeah. I want life change church to be a stick-cutting church. Amen. Let it be so. I don't have the answer. I can't solve your problem. I can't help you. But I have who gave his son and his son Christ gave his life he can do it he can do it I said Ed let's just pray right now you want to he said oh I do Carol said well if you're going to I'm going to and we got out of that little office we were in into the little foyer area and there was a coffee table and I said you get on that side and I'll get on this side and let's pray and we started praying I'll be honest, I watched him pray. I wanted to look at him. Man, he started praying. He said, what do I say? I said, I don't know. Just tell God the truth. He said, what do you mean tell him? I said, just tell him you've been, you've been mad at him, you're angry with him, you hate him. Just tell him. Huh? He said, I ought to tell God you hate him. I said, yeah, he already knows. You can tell him. So he said, God, I hate you. God. He said, I hate you, God. I hate that you took my boy. You took everything I ever wanted. I'm so angry, God. He's taking his hand. He's hitting that coffee table. I thought, well, we're going to buy a new one of these this week. <laughs> he was a strong lad. And about halfway through him telling God he hated him, he broke down and he said, God, I'm sorry. God, would you forgive me? <laughs> God, would you help me? Hallelujah. God, listen to me. All at once, I have no way to explain it except it was supernatural. Yeah. All at once, his face lit up. His eyes smiled. He opened his mouth with a smile and he looked at me and I said, what is it, Ed? He said, he did it. <laughs> he did it! He did it! I said, what'd he do, Ed? What'd he do? He said, it's gone. It's gone. I said, what's gone? He said, all the hatred. It's gone. Let me tell you something. That stick we cut that night, in three minutes, Praise did more than 30 years of counseling. Yeah. You hear me? That stick we cut that night gave him hope. The doctor couldn't do anything for that little boy, but he realized that night that little boy his was cradled in the arms of Jesus.
Jesus and one day he was going to get up and he would see him again in heaven. I'm not preaching fairy tales. I'm telling you the truth. We have a hope. A hope and a hope in this life and a help and a hope in the world to come. There is a heaven and I'm glad that by the grace of God I'm born there. I say glory to God. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Woo! Well, my heavenly home is bright and fair. I feel like traveling home. Whoa, glory to God forevermore. Sorry, my Michigan friends. I give me five more minutes, I promise. They cut that stick, threw it in the water, and the iron did swim. What you need today in your body, in your mind, in your heart, in your finances, whatever, what you need today. It's for iron to swim. Amen. You need God to do something supernatural. Yeah. Some of you are facing things you don't have the answer to. I got the, <laughs> I got the answer. <laughs> You need saved, I got the answer. You need healing, I got the answer. You need help, I got the answer. Woo, I got the answer. He's a supernatural God. He can still make iron swim. He can reach all the way down, all the way to the deep crevices of your heart and soul and take hold of the problem and the hurt and the pain and the disappointment and the sin and he'll lift it out and when he lifts it out he'll lift you up and he'll give you hope and hope and peace and joy Woo! I got the answer <laughs> I just wonder it's a little different older code I just wonder who's, who's got something you can't fix yourself just come get it come get a stick I want to give you a stick today and the iron did swim. And the iron did swim. And the iron, God's going to do something for you today. And the iron did. And the, and the iron did swim. I got the answer. And the iron did swim. He can do it. He's a miracle worker. If I run out of sticks, give me some more, boys. And the iron swim. He can do it. I got the answer. Come and help me, man. I got the answer. God is able. God is able. <coughs> We're going to cast it in the water. Come and help me, elders. Pass out some sticks. I got the answer. And the iron did swim. Ever said I'm gonna give you one. And the iron did swim. <coughs> Who else said, I need God? I need God to do something today. I need God to do something. Only God can fix it. Only God can help me. And the iron did swim. I'm talking about the supernatural. He's a supernatural God. He's the God that opened the Red Sea. He's God that stayed the sun for Joshua. He's the God that brought three Hebrew boys through the fire and they didn't even get burned. Oh, I need it. I need something from heaven. I need God to do something. I need God. Anybody else? I need God. Everybody stand with me. You that are praying, stay where you are. Everybody stand with me.
I want you to do just do something for me. Do something a little different. I know this is a little different than church normal. We need to get out of church normal. Ain't no one, no one in the Bible says you got to have church a certain way. What we do need is the Holy Spirit to move. Amen. How many know God is here right now? He's moving on hearts and lives. Now I want you to do something at the close of this service. I just want you to lift your hands and worship God. We're going to pray. Not the folded hand, just the lifted hand. Why? Because it's all through the Bible. There's more lifting than what there are folding in the Bible. And what we're going to do is we're going to thank God for the supernatural. There are going to be miracles happening in people's lives because of this today. We're going to thank Him and we're going to pray that God will move. Father, we praise You and we thank You for what You're doing in our lives. Some of us have, some of us have things laying at the bottom of our pond that we can't do anything about. But I know that the cross has the power. <clears throat> the cross has the power. Absolutely. To make iron swim. So I praise you for the supernatural strength that I feel yes, in this room. Amen. And I thank you, God, that every person that's holding a stick, it's just a stick. It represents something. It represents the power of the cross today. <laughs> When they take that home, may they set it somewhere this week. They'll be reminded of it. And may their faith grow every time they see it and say, God's got this thing under control. I know he's going to make a way for me. I know he's going to touch. I know he's going to heal. I know he's going to help. I know he's going to forgive. I know he's going to touch my baby. Whatever it may be, I pray, God, that they'll be reminded that the power of the cross is enough to make iron swim. We praise you and thank you for what you've done. In Jesus' name, let all God's people say amen. Amen. Give the Lord a shout of praise while I'm getting to the back door. God bless you. We'll see you tonight at 6 o'clock. You're dismissed.